between 1969 and 1987, Ford built nearly two million Capris. With its racy shape and sporty image, there was a Capri out there for all tastes and needs. It was a landmark car in its time, and it's just as popular today as an everyday classic. The number of people that come up to me and they say, I've had one of these, even old boys, and, or their dad's had one. Everybody's had a Capri at some stage in the family. Uh, it's nice, it's lovely. I don't think there's any other car that has this following, which is great. It's got those lovely curves on the rear quarter, and it's got the huge bulge on the bonnet, which appeals to most men. That's just pure testosterone. Uh, the women I've spoken to say it's the sleek lines, the curves, it's got feminine charm is what they say, so I think it appeals to everyone. It's classic 70s styling. It's a car I always wanted when I was young. Now my daughter's grown up, I can, I can have the car I always wanted. And that was pretty close to Ford's advertising slogan back in the early days when the car first appeared on our roads. In this programme, we'll discover why the Capri was the car you always promised yourself. And we'll meet owners and enthusiasts who keep the cars alive today on road and track. They haven't dated, they still keep up with the traffic, they still look good, and they're just great fun to drive. The Capri certainly had driver appeal, something that's seriously lacking in many of today's modern cars. It sounded good, and it looked good. From Mark I through to Mark III, the Capri was unique and distinctive. Back in 1964, Ford was generally seen as a firm making cars that didn't appeal to young people, nor have a sporty image. At the time, the only sporty Ford available in the UK was the Lotus Cortina, which under the watchful eyes of Colin Chapman had a lot of racing success. Then Ford of America sold a million Mustangs in just two years. Its success inspired Ford to produce a European version of their personal coupe. Project Colt was initiated in 1965. Its aim, to design a Mustang for the British market. A team of British engineers, headed by John Hitchman, produced prototypes which had all the features and styling of the final Capri, except for the famous elliptical side window. By the beginning of 1966, mock-ups of the new car were being shown at clinics in several European cities. There were some complaints about claustrophobia felt by the rear passengers. So the designers increased the size of the windows by developing the unique C-shaped rear glass. And they discovered that the name Colt was already registered by Mitsubishi. So Ford decided on Capri. The Capri was released to the press at the Brussels Motor Show on the 24th of January 1969. What is she cheering about? The Belgians about? were bowled over. Ah, here comes our star visitor, no less than King Bodoway himself. Incidentally, his last visit was ten years ago, but he wouldn't have missed this one for anything. Ford of Belgium's managing director, Henri Dams, respectfully welcomes him and introduces Jack Kemp and Walter Hayes. Then a hush falls upon the crowd as our August visitor pushes a button. And lo! Up goes the immaculate white cover concealing the star attraction of the Brussels car show and what is already the car sensation of the year, the glorious Capri. What's that? A door missing? Look, boys, I know you've been hustled quite a bit, but all the same, this is somewhat thick. What do you say? Oh, it's done on purpose. The king's impressed, and he says so. Our bosses look gratified. And the Capri proudly swings around, a bit of a show-off, if you ask me.
exchanging first impressions, or maybe a first order already. Why waste good film, chums? We've got plenty of folders for everyone. DiCaprio unquestionably is an eye-catcher. A sleek, impressive body, a lot of Mustang with some escort thrown in, a flattering combination. An interior which subtly combines the characteristics of a sports car with those of a comfortable touring car. Slightly over 30 seconds on the kilometer with the high-powered 2300 GT engine. King Baudouin shows more than a superficial, polite interest for our Capri's glittering charms. This is the critical attitude of the technician who wants to know what's underneath the hood. Apart from the doors, Capris that were to go on sale that year shared many major items with other cars in the current Ford range. The 1300 engine came from the new Mark I Escort, the 1600 from the Cortina and the 2.0-litre from the Corsair. All gearboxes were from the Cortina. Ford began production in November 1968 and every Ford dealer had at least one car on their forecourt by the 5th of February 69. Here's a rear view. And even a glance underneath. The accent here is on youth. As a matter of fact, the Capri is one of the very few cars that appeal to young and middle-aged alike. How'd you like this one, Sonny, for your dinky toys collection? The interior is definitely swanky. Our 10 blue Capri hostesses bravely meet a storm of inquiries. 7,000 hot prospect addresses bagged in a nine-day teasing campaign isn't a bad figure at all. With all its dignified appearance, it's got something rakish about it which appeals to the little road hog slumbering in each of us. Capri, a sunny name, destined to become a great name in the car business. Yes, sir, the car you always promised yourself. And Ford leads the way. The Ford advertising department was in full swing across the globe, promoting the new Capri, as this small selection shows. Break. This is Ford Capri. As luxurious as a limousine. Powerful as a sports car. With a choice of engines including a new 3-litre V6. With a range of models to give you exactly the car you want. Quand une voiture est aussi séduisante que la Ford Capri, certains sont prêts à tout pour en conduire une. La Ford Capri, un coupé racé, quatre places confortables, un prix sensationnel. Et vous pouvez rendre votre Capri encore plus sportive, encore plus luxueuse. Six moteurs au choix, de 7 à 15 chevaux. La Capri la plus séduisante La nouvelle 2600 GT. Accélère de 0 à 100 en 9 ,6 secondes 6. Entre nous, 
C'est une Capri 2600 GT qu'ils auraient dû emprunter. Ford Capri, la voiture de vos rêves les plus fous. There are some cars this man would sacrifice almost anything for. Like the new Ford Capri, the car you always promised yourself. Once again, Ford leads the way with an exciting fastback that seats four, even five adults. Great fun to drive. Capri handles like a sports car. And though it looks very expensive, the new Ford Capri starts at a very reasonable $2,000. Fine Capri has loads of room in front and back. And you can make Capri as luxurious or as sporty as you choose from a long list of options. The Capri is so versatile, in fact, one may not be enough. See the new Ford Capri at your Ford dealers now. Once again, Ford leads the way. Have you ever thought you were seeing things? Dreaming up dream cars? Well, go ahead. Here's the new Ford Capri. Isn't this one the car you always promised yourself? A racy, slimline fastback that seats four, even five, at a price you can afford? If you think it's too good to be true, look at the new Ford Capri very, very carefully. There's plenty of room and comfort inside. Room even for three and back. And it's exciting to drive. From a long list of options, you can turn Capri into a top-of-the-line GT. Choose from five engine sizes, manual or automatic drive. But why just dream of it all? Capri's price starts at $2,000. Once again, Ford leads the way with Capri. Many potential customers were convinced of the Capri's performance when Ford organized pro-celebrity races for the new car. Top racers of the day, like Jackie Stewart and Graham Hill, grabbed the chance to throw the Mark I around race circuits, like here at Brands Hatch in 1970. Ford of Britain never really promoted the early Capri's motorsport potential much further than this. They did, however, support the car at regular rallycross events in the 1970s, which were televised. Roger Clark was a regular winner in a four-wheel drive version. Ford did help Tom Walkinshaw win his class in his Mark I in the 1974 British Touring Car Championship. In contrast, Ford of Germany ran Mark I's in the European Touring Car Championship with great success. Dieter Glemser took the driver's title in 1971, Top honours went to Jochen Mass in 1972. Today, you won't find many of the early cars on the road, but those that do survive are loved and treasured. Michael Parsley is a typical Ford Capri owner who knows exactly why the Mark I is so special. It's just the style. You've got the body line along the side there, the, the vents. It's kind of like a, a mini Mustang. Uh, a little bit of British uh, motoring Mustang type style. I think it's got a, a flavour all of its own. And when you think about it, when this car was released, you could buy Morris Miners, uh, Austin 1100s, and they were new out. Um, the Mini was still a, uh, a new car, uh, you could still buy loads of cars which were so dated and this was, they said, a car you always promised yourself, well, I think it still is, you know, and I, I think it's a shame they stopped making them, but it was still, by stopping making them, it makes it more exclusive. And nothing was more exclusive than the Rally Sport, or RS, homologation version of the Mark I that appeared in Germany from 1970. These lightweight versions were powered by a fuel-injected 2.6-litre V6, which delivered over 150 horsepower. The car easily clocked 125 miles an hour on the German autobahns. I play it hard and dirty, but I deliver the goods and fast. I'm on a tricky assignment. By 1973, the Mark I had sold over a million units, but sales were dropping off. It was time for a revamp. 
Production of the Capri Mark II began in January 1974 and Ford claimed 151 modifications. The new car was longer, wider and taller, but the most obvious change was the addition of a hatchback. Mechanically, the Mark IIs were generally similar to the Mark Is. And the ads were just as cheesy. Meet Capri II, a beautiful new car, a practical new car. And here to tell you about it are two people who know a bit about cars. You know, I've stopped racing, but I'm still impressed by exciting cars, like Ford's brand new Capri 2. It's got a new rear door that makes loading easy. It's beautiful. And both rear seats fold down for 100% more luggage space. There are new reclining front seats and a new heated rear window in my GT. Beautiful. Capri 2 also has wider rear track for better road holding and handling, and a choice of proven engines. Try Capri 2 yourself. It's a great car. You never want to get out of the driving seat. Beautiful. Ford Capri 2. A beautiful new shape full of practical new ideas. Several years before he made his name as a TV tough guy, throwing Capris around in the professionals, Martin Shaw was used by Ford for his gentler side. He may now cringe a bit at this cinema ad from 1974. Do you speak English? I am English. Oh. Would you like a little? Oh, yes, please. Won't you get in and have a warm-up for the Ages. Do you want a cigar? Yes, please. In 1978 saw a further evolution of the Capri with the introduction of the Mark III. The exterior was modified to improve the aerodynamics with an extended leading edge to the bonnet and distinctive quad headlamps. Other external changes included plastic side mouldings along the doors and a boot-mounted rear spoiler. There were new trim colours and a smaller, sportier steering wheel. Back in 1978, TV presenter Michael Wong travelled to Italy to tell us a little more about the new Mark III and the cars it was up against. When the Ford Capri strode onto the scene in 1969, not only did it capture the hearts of motorists right across Europe, but it practically invented a new class of car, the popular speciality car. For the first time from a volume manufacturer, here was a car that was sporty, fun to drive, and yet crammed full of practical, useful features. And what's more, the price was right. It was bound to be a success. Of course, other manufacturers weren't slow to realize the possibilities. Today, including the present Capris, there are no less than 36 cars in this class. And yet, if we look at the principal six competitors, one fact emerges. Whilst the others are derived from existing sedans, Capri is unique. It was designed to be itself. It wasn't restyled from something else. And that fact makes Capri the yardstick by which all the competition is measured. And that fact 
gives New Capri a unique head start against all the competition. Let's look at a typical Capri buyer. Now, right across Europe, he's likely to be between 35 and 41, probably married, with one child. Now, all that is starting to add up to the description of a pretty ordinary sort of guy. And yet, this ordinary sort of guy doesn't see himself that way at all. The particular reason he buys a Capri is because he believes it helps him to be more like this. Well, frankly, I wouldn't mind a bit of life like that. How about you? But of course, in the real world, things just can't be as glamorous as that. We can't all be fashion photographers or racing drivers. But what the new Capri does is capture the excitement of that style of life and match it to the everyday needs of everyday Europeans. With new Capri, the buyer will find that his needs are even better catered for. More importantly, he'll find that the Capri now looks even more sporty, even more clean cut, even more special. Throughout the range, in 17 subtly important ways, Capri has come of age. New Capri is more sporty, more functional, and yet just as versatile. Here's how. At the front, Capri boasts a four headlamp system, four powerful halogen units giving improved lighting performance. Now, on all models, an integral road-hugging front spoiler. All steel and making a one-piece pressing with the front valance, this air dam extends the performance and economy characteristics of Capri S to all Capri models by lowering the side wind sensitivity and drag factors. Tough, wide section bumpers now finished in sporty, fashionable matte black are not just fashionable. These bumpers are coated in durable polyester to defeat stone chips and fend off rust. And now, housing indicators. The new louvered front grille looks great too. But these aerofoil slats reduce drag at high speed aiding performance, aiding economy. Positive sportiness is further underscored throughout the range by black exterior features, keying all models to the Capri S, complementing the cleaner, more sporty line. The third door is still there, of course, surely the most practical feature of all. But for the new Capri S, this tailgate spoiler 
a good-looking addition with performance pluses. This spoiler gives new Capri S a 5% improvement in aerodynamics over the already sensational S with a drag factor of only 0.374. The benefits to traction and stability are real and measurable. The benefits to looks are immediate and very, very exciting. On the road, too, new Capri is even more sporty to drive, even easier to maintain as well. The fade-free gas rear shock absorbers, formerly available only on S and gear, are now standard. L, GL, S and gear. Capri still offers more engines than any competitor, ranging from 1.3 to 3 litre units, from 68 to 138 DIN horsepower. While to assist easy maintenance, the rear brake linings can now be checked with the wheels in place. So, new Capri builds on the strengths which Capri has always had. Inside, too, sensible, subtle changes have continued to complement Capri's crisp new lines. On L, full cloth seating with Concorde cloth inserts plus Savannah borders. On GL, diamond cloth throughout. With L and GL taking the precise three-spoke steering wheel from Capri S, L, GL and gear Capris now have a new grey soft feel Alka fascia with instrumentation sporting new clearer graphics and easier to see orange pointers. On GL and above, the new Capri now boasts this. It's a removable, molded, rigid, one-piece rear parcel tray. And because it's hinged, it can be lifted up by the tailgate. So, that is an important customer benefit. Time after time, styling emerges as the vital factor governing customer choice. Time after time, Capri emerges as the styling trendsetter. And now, with these new refinements, even better looking than ever. The last brand new Capri was sold in 1986, but today there are hordes of enthusiasts who drive, cherish, enjoy and even make a living from this iconic classic car. It's not just the Capri that keeps Roger Chinnery's cash tills ringing at affordable cars in Essex. He deals in all classic Fords from the 1950s to the 1980s. In his showroom, you'll find practically every type, from Cortina and Corsair to Escort and Zodiac. So why specialise in Fords? The answer is obvious. I like Fords. Um, I worked for Ford when I was 18, and for a Ford dealer. And uh, there's such a variety of cars still within the Ford range, from the old populars right up to Cosworths and uh, the Capris are just nicely in the middle there and uh, I suppose I just, I like old Fords. And it's the Capri that has that special place in Roger's heart. Not only does he think it's a great car, it also sells well in the present climate. Capris are very popular at the moment. Um, I think part of the thing is they haven't dated, they still keep up with the traffic, they still look good and they're just great fun to drive. So where does he find a healthy supply of Capris to keep his customers happy? They're all people who've had the cars for some time, they're enthusiasts, people that want the cars to go to a good home, don't want to see it sort of being trashed around the local town if you like. 
and just want to see somebody else enjoy the car and care for it in the same way they have done. So they come to us and say, look, rather you had the car, find a good owner for it. I don't want lots of people coming around just want to have a test drive. Over the years, Roger has found there's no such thing as a typical Capri owner. There's such a range. There's people who've perhaps had one when they were new 30 years ago. There's guys who perhaps saw the 2.8 injection in the showrooms when they were 17, 18 and thought, wow, I'm going to have one of those one day. So there's just such a cross-reference of, of the sort of people that buy these things. And once you've taken the plunge and bought a Capri, there's very little chance of being baffled by the engineering. They're very easy to work on, they're cheap to run, they're easy to get parts for. Um, the later ones with the five-speed gearbox is reasonably economical. All cars are prone to the dreaded rust, but it pays to know where corrosion can strike. So where are the sensitive spots on the Capri? All over the place. You do have to be a little bit wary when you're looking around if they do go rusty, especially around all the, all the bits you can see, the wings, the wheel arches, the sills, and some bits you can't see, like the, um, the chassis rails and things like that. So um, if they've been looked after and been treated and polished and waxed or whatever you know and again, then they're fine and they'll last I won't say forever, but they'll last a long time. The 2.8 injection is probably one of the most fun to drive. The early Mark 1s, I mean things like the RS 3.1, is quite an unusual car with big spoiler and the, the, um, the, the slightly bigger engine which gives it a bit more of an edge over the earlier ones. But even so, the, the later ones really are the ones that are, are good fun to drive. So let's send Roger out into the Essex countryside to get an expert's view from the driving seat. This is a Capri 280, one of the last of the Capris built. More commonly known as the Brooklands because of its unique Brooklands green paintwork. These cars really are great fun to drive. The last of the injection Capris had a much more advanced suspension, if you can call it advanced, for a 20 year old car. But it was a bit lower, a bit stiffer, and they really do handle well. They're great fun to drive, and they will keep up with the traffic, especially the ones with the V6 engines. Not very many cars you can polish up and take to a show on a Sunday and then get back in it on Monday morning and go to work in reasonable comfort with a reasonable heater. And they do attract quite a lot of attention too. People remember these cars as the car that uh, they always promise themselves. Lovely exhaust note from the V6 engine as well. So although they've got a radio cassette, maybe you don't even need it. Capri's always did have a bit of a tendency and a bit of a reputation for being a little bit tail happy. Well, that is true to a degree, but then depends how you drive the car. On dry roads, they really do handle very, very well. Well, that's the dealer's opinion on the road, but there are some out there who like to drive their Capris a little faster. spa Francochamps in Belgium. For many, the best racetrack in the world. Today, Capri's is still out in force and 
this historic venue. Oh, I love it here. I, I come as often as I can. It's my second time this year. I've been about five, six times before. And I just can't get enough of Spa. It's the most fantastic circuit, it really is. Many British Capri racers have made the short trip across the channel for the chance to throw their machines around Spa in the annual Top Hat Historic Festival. They're only too keen to show just how quick and competitive this classic Ford still is. Many of the competing cars look just as well prepared today as those that were raced in the 70s. And it seems that once you've driven a Capri in anger, nothing else will really do. I've always raced Capri since I started racing. When I was an apprentice I was in a Ford garage, so I think there's a certain amount of Ford imbued in me. And Rovers were dominating when I started racing and I thought, can't have that, got to get a Capri up there. So I got a Capri going and stayed with them ever since. This is an ex-Gordon Spice car and it was built by CC Cars for Ford and it is beautiful to drive. Peter Mallet's three-litre Capri may not be quite as quick as Dave Thomas's, but it's the pride of the paddock. It wasn't quite as glowing when he first set eyes on it. Well, I had a uh, Mark II three-litre Capri, but uh, unfortunately on April the 9th, 1995, I rolled it into a ball at Cadwell Park because I ran out of brakes. Um, I then went to visit my father and next door was a lady who was selling a 1600 LS for 50 pounds. And this is the car that I've got here now. Um, we then spent five weeks taking all of the mechanicals out of the Mark II and putting it into this and welding this and stiffening it to make it into a three litre S. So in fact, it's a 1600 LS shell that we've stiffened and made into a three litre S. There have been many opportunities to go sell it and buy something else, but there's so many things that you can do with these within the spirit of the regulations that um, it makes it interesting, even if you're not competitive, just to, to, to play with the thing. One Capri that really is competitive is this glorious 1972 car, full of history and still in its original gold and white livery. I bought the car out of the Tom Walkinshaw Museum and we've been rebuilding it since then. Before that it was owned by uh, the Kent Tobacco Company, uh, but they got a, a chap in uh, Holland called Franz Lubin to run it and we've been in touch with him about all the racing it did in 1972, which has been, because we're starting to assemble the history of the car which is great. They built it and ran it for 31 races so it was sort of really semi-works, it had all the works bits on it and uh, Franz is as an ex-Ford a test driver himself so he obviously had the right contacts to be able to do that. It competed in the 72 Euro European Touring Car Championship amongst other races uh, and it did, uh, it got a second uh, in Silverstone with Torino Hazemans and Jean-Claude Frank driving it. It got a a third and a fourth and other parts of the uh, other races during the series so you know, it, 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 it came in in the top top three or four a number of times. Eight Capris go out for battle on a track that demands respect. It's a circuit that you either find difficult or just just love and, and I'm afraid I love it. Um, there are one or two corners that you have to be careful but basically, um, you come down the hill that's behind us into Eau Rouge, over my shoulder, and from there, uh, apart from one or two tight corners, you never go below third gear. This is a four-speed gearbox. Um, and it's very, very difficult not to enjoy yourself here. It's just so much fun. Every time you come to a corner, you know that you can plant your foot to come out of it, and the car's going to stick. There's so much grip. There's so much space and there's some good people around you that you can play with as well. It's just a tremendous circuit and a wonderful meeting. So we're all set for the rolling start with the Kent Capri leading the way on what is definitely a slippery surface. The guys are going to have to be very careful for the first couple of laps. Gary Cole is taking the first stint in Peter's car for this two-driver race and he's tightening his belts as we head down to the daunting pink at Eau Rouge for the very first time. No dramas there. Now it's just a question of picking off some of the slower runners and keeping out of the way of the quicker ones. There are over 110 cars out there, so it's going to be quite a busy race. On to 
the second lap, and Gary's getting more confident. He usually races a Citroën BX, so the rear-wheel drive Capri could be a bit of a handful, especially if you get too near those slippery curves. Well, he got away with it. Back at the front, the Kent car is battling for the lead with a TVR. Back on board with Gary, who's working his way steadily up the leaderboard. still greasy in places, but this time it's the guys in front that are hitting trouble. After just a few laps, the leaders are on his tail. There's a saying, to finish first, first you have to finish. Somebody should have told the driver of the red BMW. Also on track is famous Capri racer Graham Skid Scarborough. There he goes in his blue and white Capri. He'll eventually finish an amazing fourth overall. As the sunshine dries out the track, the gamble of starting on dry weather tyres seems to be paying off. distance, the cars have to stop for a driver change. Gary hands over to Peter Matt. That seemed to go fairly smoothly. So it's back into the fray for our red and white Capri. They're now down in 60th position, and the track is looking very busy. to cope with Eau Rouge. Is he brave enough to take a place into this famous corner? eventually come home 43rd, an improvement of 65 places from their starting position.
further up the pack, David Thomas's blue and white Capri is doing even better, carving through the field with ease as the sun shines through. Look how well set up this Capri is. It corners like it's on rails, while many of those around him are getting well out of shape. on board for a lap and a bit of this great circuit as we head for a creditable 11th place. If you think motorsport should be all about overtaking, this is the class of racing for you.
and a half, it's pretty good going. One thing's certain, Capri boys will all be back next year for their regular dose of spa excitement. Silverstone doesn't just put on the British Grand Prix each year. There are scores of events here catering for every sort of petrol head. And each summer at the Ford Fair, the Capri has its own special place. Practically every type is on show from all corners of the UK. From early Mark 1s right through to the Brooklands, all Capris are here. Including the rarest of the rare to make any Capri fan drool. I just fell in love with it. As soon as I looked at it, I fell in love with it. That's a car for me. It's a 1973 Mark I Capri. It's the RS3100 model, of which only 248 were ever made, and 200 of those were sold in the UK. Um, I acquired it. Uh, about six months ago, uh, been in storage for six years before that, and um, another 12 years prior to that, I think, with the previous owner. So it's um, completely unrestored, fully original, and it's a pleasure to drive. It's a whole different driving experience, going back to rear wheel drive, lots of power, um, typical 70s car handling and braking. You've got to think in advance of what you're doing and respect the car and its power. It teaches you to drive. But even if you can't quite stretch to an early RS, it's still possible to locate a Mark I that hasn't succumbed to the dreaded rust bug. These days, they're more with a Mark I, they're more exclusive than uh, a Ferrari. Uh, so they do have a head turning uh, effect. They're very, very um, positive on handling. If you get the car handling right, then it's, it's a real fun to drive. Everyone says they're tail happy, they're not. you just got to know what you're doing with them. You've got to know how to drive them, and you've also got to know how to set them up. Um, and that's the ideal thing about these, is people can modify them themselves uh, using Ford parts and make them into a really good usable car, which is good for you know, 20, 30 years. I mean, this one's 34 years old, so they're very good in that way. And there's even more of the later ones still around. They're just great to drive, they're really nice, I've always liked them. Well I've always wanted a 3 litre S. Um, when I was 18 I could only afford to insure a 1.6. Um, obviously now I'm a few years older, I can afford the insurance, so I finally managed to get one about a month ago. If you think Linda's look smart, feast your eyes on this. Some owners go to extreme measures to make their cars look good. I actually don't like driving it because uh, you're going down a road and a stone comes up or you hear clonks and bangs underneath you think oh dear and because it's been detailed underneath you think oh there's another night's work or you know if a stone hits a bonnet you can't match the paint and you know it's, it's an expensive job. It's nice people coming and saying oh isn't that nice but it's, it's my own personal pleasure it, it's my, my little baby and you know I, I, I don't know it's probably it's probably very sad but I like doing it. You know, and I, I don't like leaving things dirty. These cars are were made 20 odd years ago. This is how they should be. You know, this is the way it should be. Uh, if you want to put different brakes on or different engines, well, go to a newer car. There's there's precious few nice Capris and Escorts around uh, without having to cut them up, fitting other engines in. You know, just destroying. A good car you know you should look at them and take them for what they are they're a 20 odd 30 odd year old design take it as that and and be happy with it in complete contrast is this purple beast there'll always be two sides to every argument and you can't deny that both capris will turn heads in completely different ways it's each to their own some people prefer concourse original cars, some people like to modify them. If you, if you modify the car, that puts a bit of you into it. It's something different. Um, if everybody liked the same thing, it'd be a boring world. The car started off life as a standard 2.8. Um, it's gone through several guises over the years. Ten years ago, it was featured in Max Power magazine, and it was actually painted cabbage purple. That's how it got the cabbage logo. 
I bought the car two and a half years ago as a total wreck. We pulled the car apart, completely rebuilt it, bodywork, mechanical, interior. Um, it used to have a 2.8 turbo in it. It's now got a full stage three Cosworth internal V6, just under three litre, pushing out 427 brake horse at the rear wheels with 150 brake horse and nitrous oxide sitting in the boot. It used to have a PlayStation 2 in there, that's been taken out and now refitted with an Xbox, three TV screens, full ProLogic Dolby surround sound system inside the car. Some Capri owners love their cars so much, they think nothing of popping down to Silverstone from Scotland to show off their pride and joy. Well, I've loved them since they first came out with a Capri Classic and as from then I've, I really think I enjoy them. I've had 50, I've owned 50 over the years, so I really enjoy them. Just love to drive them, love to restore them, loads of work, easy to repair, and it's just great. <laughs> If the day becomes a little too overwhelming, there's a chance to get your car out onto the famous Silverstone tarmac. It probably won't be as dramatic as racing around Spa, but you can at least pretend to be a racing driver for a few minutes. Just don't forget to ditch those distracting accessories. That's better. Few owners get the opportunity to find out what their cars can really do and how they handle. Just make sure you keep an eye on your mirrors and don't stick it in the gravel in front of your watching friends. Some people don't really care what type of form they take on the track. At the Ford Fair, you'll also find plenty of Capris for sale if you want to join that exclusive and varied band of Capri owners. You've got old people who've had the car right the way from new. You've got, uh, I met a gentleman the other day who was disabled, he's been uh, restoring Capri, Capri's although he can't even walk. I think there isn't a typical one. You've got youngsters coming into it, you've got the older people, you've got middle-aged people like myself. Um, but yeah, I don't think there is a typical one. There's even women who are doing them up. And it's got good motorsport history, so I think it's just a nice leisure car which you can still use today. The Capri took Ford into a completely new part of the car market. It set a trend for others to follow carved itself a place in motoring history. I always loved the Capri really, I always loved the shape. Um, sounds a bit girly really, but you know, sort of see, seeing it from when I was a little, little lad and uh, it's just side on view. Absolutely fantastic car. Oh, they had everything, didn't they? Um, they the looks, the power, the, uh, I don't know, style. Um, a little bit, a little bit naff perhaps, but, but you could put up with that. <laughs> Lots of people have said in recent years that if Ford started making it again, people would buy it, but whether that's actually true, I don't know. Um, but I think the Capri will still be here, I and mean, it's still here after over 30 years, so why shouldn't it be here in another 20?